So today, I want us to think about how Jesus broke down the barriers that were set up against women in his time. Now, before we go any further, I have to say that I'm at something of a disadvantage here, and for several reasons. First of all, we're talking about 2,000 years ago, and our way of life is so totally different from theirs. Secondly, we are about 2,000 miles away, and our culture is very different from theirs even today. And thirdly, well, I'm a bloke, and... uh, Well, I will do my best. I'm very aware that some people will feel that I'm not best placed to comment on issues relating to women. That being said, later on, I'd like you to hear from a friend of mine who is serving in a church on the south coast of England. She has been doing some biblical research in this area, and I think you'll find what she has to say quite enlightening. So let's begin by painting a picture of what it was likely to have felt like to be a woman in Jesus' day. Now, we can detect from writings of the day, both inside and outside the Bible, what this must have been like. There is a well-known first century Jewish historian called Flavius Josephus. This is the best guess of what we think he might have looked like. And he wrote this. A woman is inferior to a man in all respects. So let her obey, not that she may be abused, but that she may be ruled, for God has given power to the man. And he went on to describe how women are to be transferred from the hands of one male authority figure to another. Women were possessions which could be handed around from one man to another. And this meant that they had no rights when it came to divorce. A man could divorce his wife, but a woman could not divorce her husband. And the the philosophy they used to justify this was, was simple. They considered that the owner can walk away from his property, but the property can't walk away from its owner. So women were regarded as property in Jesus' day. They had almost no rights in law, and their testimony was inadmissible in court very often. Here's here's Josephus again. But let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. So women were effectively put in the same category as slaves, who were not allowed to testify due to the ignobility of their soul. Those are the words that he used. Now, by our standards, this, of course, was systemic abuse. And it was abuse that was driven home at many levels of their culture. Women were second-class citizens and were anchored in this place because of their creation as female. In fact, in the Jewish morning prayer, which the Apostle Paul would have recited regularly in his uh, pre-Christian days, a man would say this to God. I thank thee that thou hast not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Now, let me quote Paul's words in Galatians. Writing to those Christians there, he said this, There is no longer any distinction between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ. So what Paul was probably doing here in that verse was taking the daily Jewish man's prayer and turning it on its head. These distinctions which exist in society should never be replicated in the Church of Christ. That was his argument. So women had a pretty rough deal in the first century. And there's many, uh, there are many other places that we could look at to show that. So... Let's now ask the question, how did Jesus regard women? Was he any different from other men of his day? And if so, what has that to say for us today, 2,000 years later and 2,000 miles distant? Now, when we start looking at the Gospels to see if Jesus copied these attitudes, we have a few surprises. In fact, for a Jewish man, Jesus' positive treatment of women is 
and open relationships with them was nothing short of scandalous. So what made Jesus so different from the traditional Jewish male of the time? Well, firstly, he was even-handed with women. He conversed with women in the same way that he conversed with men. Even his disciples were surprised by this. You may know that Jesus has an encounter with a woman from Samaria. You can read it in John chapter 4, if you like. Jesus met her at midday at a well and talked with her about receiving living water from him. It was a conversation that was to change her life completely and it's a very exciting story if you get a chance to read it. And he had a conversation with her and that was the surprise. It's a conversation. As they finished talking, Jesus' disciples who had gone off into town uh, showed up. And this is how John records the incident. Just then, His disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Don't you find it interesting that the disciples were obviously affected by this approach to women and were surprised that Jesus was there talking to this woman apparently quite freely? Now, another countercultural aspect of Jesus' behaviour was this. He would speak to women openly and in public. Now we've already seen that in part in John chapter 4, but this was highly unusual for Jewish men. Conventional practice would be for a man to ignore a woman in public unless he was probably buying goods from her in the market, for example. But Jesus spoke freely. And we've already seen that with the woman at the well. He even spoke freely with a woman caught in the act of adultery. And you can find that in John chapter 8. He didn't condemn her, but he spoke with her in such a way as to help her change her lifestyle. Then I also noticed that Jesus spoke tenderly to a widow. We see this in the town of Nain. Jesus was travelling with his disciples And he had already attracted a large crowd. And here's how Luke records it. As Jesus and the crowd approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin that they were carrying and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now, there is more to this than meets the eye. We can see that while most women had a rough deal at the hands of some men, but at the same time they were dependent on them. Few women could manage to make a career of their own. But they were, uh, they were sorry, there were a few women who managed to make a career of their, their own, but they were very much the exceptions. Most women had to rely on being married or having another man in their household who would provide the basics for them. Otherwise, they were reduced to penury. So when Jesus encountered this lady and discovered that she had lost the only two men who would be able to care for her, her husband and her son, his heart just went out to her. And Jesus went to the extent of bringing the son back to life, in part to put this woman back in a position of relative security. Now, of course, this miracle tells us other things about Jesus, but let's not overlook the fact that it was motivated by compassion and compassion for a woman who would otherwise be destitute. Jesus cared about her that much. Do you know, even on the way to the cross, Jesus responded to a bunch of women who were weeping about his capture. He spoke to women openly and in public. 
And then I also notice, and we've seen hints of this already, that he treated women with dignity. Jesus afforded women the full intrinsic value of being real people. He often spoke in a thoughtful and a caring way, especially to women in distress or in trouble. One example I particularly like is found in Luke's Gospel. It was a Sabbath day and Jesus was teaching in a synagogue. And there was a woman in the service who had been bent over double for 18 years. She couldn't straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Madam, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Boy, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall there. But in a flash, the atmosphere was changed by the synagogue ruler. He said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Grumpy. And Jesus didn't mince his words. You hypocrites, he said. Doesn't each of you release his ox or donkey on the Sabbath to give it water? Then shouldn't this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, be released on the Sabbath from what bound her? Now, uh, I'm sure you can detect the subtext of what Jesus is saying here. Are you telling me this woman is of less value than your donkey? You set your donkey free so it can have a drink. So why shouldn't I set this lady free to be, to be whole again? And there's more. Embedded in that verse is a phrase that would have stung these toffee-nosed clerics. These men, including our resident grumpy guts, carried huge pride around with them, that they were the sons of Abraham, and therefore they were God's chosen Jewish men. And what did Jesus call this woman? He said, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, be set free on the Sabbath day? She is just as much part of God's chosen people as any man in this building. And when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted at the wonderful things he was doing. The toffee-nosed bigots were disgraced and put in their place, and the ordinary people just loved it. Jesus was affording this unnamed woman a spiritual status with God equal to that of any man. He treated women with dignity, and so should we. Well, as I promised earlier on, I'd really like to introduce you to a friend of mine, Emma. You can see her on the other side of the screen. And uh, Emma, just tell us what you're doing in terms of ministry at the moment. OK, I'm the uh, assistant minister at, at Victoria Baptist Church, where we worked together for, for nine months before your retirement. Yes. Uh, and I'm training as a Baptist minister, doing my um, training at Spurgeon's College and doing a master's in theology there at the same time. Now, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this, this master's in theology because I think the subject area is very close to what we've been thinking about this morning. Just sketch it out for us. Sure. So I'm, I'm looking at women in, of the New Testament who were engaged in all the roles of the functions mentioned in Ephesians 4.11, uh, where Christ is given to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And I'm looking at how throughout the New Testament, women fulfilled all of those roles and more besides, such as hosting churches in their households and uh, supporting the church financially and so on. Absolutely fascinating. Now, obviously, uh, what we've been thinking about this morning is the way in which Jesus broke down barriers that have been put up by society uh, against mm. women. Um, have you come across any of that in your research? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for the first for the first female disciples, it was a very patriarchal world. Women were owned. They were property. Um, and Jesus came in and was totally countercultural. Um, he had female friends, female disciples, female sponsors, if you like. Um, there's a great little verse in Luke chapter 8, um, and it starts, that the 12 were with him and also some women 
uh, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And he mentions um, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Chizza, who managed Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. Um, so women were always included in Jesus's band of followers. Um, so that's, you know, in encouraging Mary to sit at his feet and listen to his teaching. That was only ever a male privilege. But Jesus led the way in encouraging women to also engage with him. Uh, and that's fascinating, isn't it? Because um, so often we think of the disciples or the disciples as just men, um, mm. partly because that's the way it's written up by, by the gospel writers. But actually the word disciple covers a much bigger group than, than just the blokes yes. that were surrounding Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it wasn't just the 12. Um, we know there was a much wider group that Jesus encouraged to go into the highways and byways. Um, and Luke particularly draws that out in his gospel, that wherever the 12 are, there are the women there as well. Um, and he names a lot of them. And he, <laughs> Luke seems to hone in on um, the fact that Jesus lifted women and gave them equality. Um, he healed them. He delivered them. He... Um, he forgave their sin, he treated them kindly and gently, but he radically gave them uh, status and significance and esteem that sure. their society didn't. Sure, sure. Uh, do you want to give us an example? Um, yeah, so um, I think one of my favourite uh, stories is in Luke chapter 7, where uh, Jesus is having dinner with Simon the Pharisee and his friends and a, a terribly sinful woman enters the room and uh, she weeps at Jesus' feet and she, her attitude is so gracious and, and grateful to Jesus for what he's done for her. And um, in comparison, uh, Simon the Pharisee has a very uh, hoity-toity attitude that he, he's righteous because he's a Pharisee, he's righteous because of the law and who is this woman? Um, and actually throughout Luke's gospel, he seems to pair stories where women come off really positively and the men don't do so well. Oh, is that right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, just, just think it, even about um, Elizabeth and Zechariah right at the beginning of the gospel. Elizabeth oh, yeah. responds to faith. Zech Zechariah says, well, you know, are you sure this is all going to happen? You know, what's going on? Um, so she comes off with a lot more faith. Um, Luke 13 has a story of a crippled woman and the synagogue ruler. And again, the male attitude is very um, proud and a little bit hypocritical, whereas the, the women seem to come with humility, faith and, and gratitude to Jesus. Um, and then yeah, at the we, cross... We've at just the cross, looked at that, no. actually. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and the women yeah. were there at the cross... Um, whilst most of the men were in hiding, apart from John, uh, of course, they'd denied and betrayed and, and uh, let Jesus down. Um, and Jesus chooses those those women to be his first witnesses, because at the resurrection, it's the women who have gone to the tomb to anoint Jesus at, whilst the men are hiding. Um, so yeah, throughout, he sort of makes a deliberate effort to show women in a great light and how Jesus, um, as I say, gave them worth and status and valued their input, which totally turned the culture on its head. Brilliant. Yeah. Having looked at all of these examples, I mean, especially you've been looking at Luke, obviously, um, just spin forward to, to today. Do you think that those examples have things that we can learn from? Does it, does it, does it, do they give us... Um, principles that we can put into practice today yeah definitely I mean the, the church should be leading the way in um, the equality of male and female um, in, a, in a sense what Jesus did was constantly work towards redeeming woman back to her pre-fall state where she was Adam's equal and partner and helper and um, that was in no way an inferior helper. You know, God, God, the Holy Spirit is called our helper. There's no inferiority implied. Uh, so it's very redemptive when Jesus, um, how, in the way Jesus treats women. And the church should be exactly the same. Um, there shouldn't be any barrier to uh, women being involved in any of the ministries that are mentioned in the New Testament and that happen in the church today. Um, 
Paul, obviously in Galatians, says that there's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus, that just as there's no slave and free or Jew and Gentile, um, there's there's freedom for, for women to function fully and the church should probably assess people on the basis of the gifts and call God's put on their life rather than their gender. Yeah, 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 fine. Yeah, wonderful. Um, can, I, can I just, I'll just add one in as well. Um, yeah, go on. Um, in that comparison sort of thing um, that we looked at in Luke, it's also interesting to see that a similar thing happens um, at the beginning of John's Gospel because Nicodemus, um, a religious man, comes to Jesus secretly in the night, whereas Jesus goes to meet a Samaritan woman at the well in the middle of the day. And whereas Nicodemus is cautious about exercising faith in Jesus, even though Jesus has laid what it what it means to be born again out clearly for him, he's hesitant. Whereas this woman gratefully receives forgiveness and the good news that the Messiah has come and immediately rushes to tell the world. Um, and, and I think that's often the case in the church today as well, that women are um, less reluctant than the men, perhaps, to yeah. rush out and share the good news. Okay. Um, and that's not to belittle men in any way, um, but rather to encourage them and say, you know, don't be hesitant, guys. You know, let's let's do this together. And, and, and for my money, in, in John chapters three and four, obviously Nicodemus was a, this sort of high class ruler. In fact, Jesus talks him, talk, sorry, Jesus addresses him as, uh, I think it's the teacher of Israel. Whereas mm. Nicodemus talks to Jesus as a rabbi, Jesus yeah. describes him as the rabbi. So maybe he mm. was the sort of the sort of Billy Graham of the Jews or something. I don't know. But he yeah. was sort of the, the, the top notch teacher. Certainly and, and was. He says, yeah. You don't even understand this, do you? Hasn't got it. Yeah. And, and, and then in John chapter four, you've got this lady who who society would regard as the lowest of the low. I mean, she was female. She was a Samaritan. She was having to get water midday bloody blah, blah we know that an outcast, and yeah. i'm sure john is expecting us to notice the comparison here that jesus yeah. is giving dignity to a woman and and through throughout the got the gospel writers um very much show the outcasts in a positive light so the widow uh, at the temple who gives her all even though it seems a very small amount um the pharisees are giving and making a big display of their, their and they're proud and they're saying look at how great our work are but but the gospel writers lift up the 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 widows and the outcasts to say actually just look at their heart you know Anna Anna the prophetess was devoted in the temple she was there all the time even though she was a widow so widows were also you know the lowest of the low um, and far down Mm -hmm. the pecking order um, socially and economically and yet we see Jesus really uh, honoring them and lifting them up great Fantastic. Emma, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, That's been really helpful and helped us to sort of understand and expand what we've already been looking at this morning. God bless you. See you soon. Absolute privilege. Thank you very much. God bless. Pleasure. See you soon. Jesus came to earth not primarily as a male, but as a person. He treated women not primarily as females, but as human beings. He broke down the barrier of gender. The foundation stone of Jesus' attitude towards women was his vision of them as people, to whom and for whom he had come. He broke down the barrier of worthlessness. He did not perceive them primarily in terms of their sex, age or marital status. He considered them in terms of their relationship to God. He broke down the barrier of low self-esteem. A woman could enter Jesus' orbit and know that she will be treated with dignity and with compassion and with respect. And Jesus smashed the barriers their culture had erected against women. And I, for one, want to live like him. Well, from here you can like, you can subscribe and you can click elsewhere to see some more videos from this channel that I hope will feed your faith.